I want to give you a quick analysis of Twelfth Night now that you've read it. Um, <clears throat> so we want to begin with some background on the actual Twelfth Night Festival. So you may have been wondering why the play was called Twelfth Night and what Twelfth Night is. Um, Twelfth Night was traditionally a festival that took place on the Twelfth Night of Christmas. So um, you've probably heard the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas and The Twelve Nights of Christmas, of course, correspond. And those twelve days are the twelve days that it took for the wise men to follow the star. And finally, uh, twelve days after Christ's birth, they arrived uh, to see him and they had their epiphany. So that's why it's called the Feast of the Epiphany. Um, the twelfth night after Christmas is the official beginning of carnival season, and we in Louisiana know carnival season better uh, as Mardi Gras season. Um, so this is the, the time of year when everybody can celebrate, act a little crazy, and get it all out of their systems before uh, the Lenten season, which leads up to Easter. Um, <clears throat> so the Twelfth Night Festival was considered a night of reversal presided over by the Lords of Misrule. So this was a night when anybody could do anything. People would often wear disguises and get up to all kinds of mischief. Um, and it was generally a pretty crazy party. Um, and so one of the big ideas was that people could have for at least one night anything they wanted. They could be anybody they wanted to be. So kings could become peasants and peasants could become kings. And this is where we get the um, tradition of the king cake because anybody could sort of be king for an evening. And so people would, again, kind of wear masks, um, which we were familiar with from Mardi Gras, and pretend to be someone else for a night. And they could change their stations if only for one night. And so all of these things put together, uh, you can see how they kind of relate to the play of Twelfth Night. So uh, there are lots of people kind of wearing masks and disguises, pretending to be people they aren't. Um, the, uh, the idea of lords of misrule or mischief, um, lots of mischief and, and plots are hatched. Uh, during the play. So a very appropriate play for this Twelfth Night or the beginning of Carnival season. Um, before you read Twelfth Night, I hope that you viewed our video on the introduction to Twelfth Night and we listed out in that video the co um, common traits of Elizabethan or Shakespearean comedy. So now that you've read the play, I'd like for us to go back through these and to highlight how they each appear in Twelfth Night, and this may help you with your midterm paper if you decide to write about Twelfth Night. Um, so the first feature is separation and unification, and that primarily has to do with Viola and her brother Sebastian. So at the beginning of the play, we meet both of them and they are separated and they don't know that the other uh, has survived the shipwreck. And by the end of the play, they are finally unified again and, and put back together. So um, we're rooting for them throughout the play to finally get to be together again. Then we have mistaken identity. So um, there's plenty of mistaken identity in terms of people mistaking Viola for Cesario, although she is uh, um, intentionally pretending to be someone else. But particularly um, the point in the play in which Olivia mistakes Sebastian for Viola and actually marries um, the brother rather than the sister would be an instance of mistaken identity. Um, clever tricksters and servants, we definitely have that in Twelfth Night, so um, Maria and um, Sir Toby uh, and even Festy the Jester are all kind of smarter than their um, than their masters, and Viola, uh, who is the ser servant of Orsino, is also smarter probably than Orsino. She's probably the smartest person in the play. So um, in, in terms of that reversal of fortune that we talked about with the Twelfth Night Festival, um, many of the servants are kind of overtaking their masters in terms of intelligence. Then we have multiple intertwining plots. Now we definitely have that in Twelfth Night, and if you list out all the different plots, you come up with maybe four or five. So we have the plot of Viola and her brother who are shipwrecked and separated. Then we have the plot of Orsino's love for Olivia. We have the plot of uh, Viola's cross-dressing and all of its consequences. And then we have the plot of the servant's a trick that they're playing on Malvolio to get him kicked out of the house. 
A mummer or fool, of course, we have Festy the Jester who walks around singing songs. A large solution, unveiling, or aha moment. Uh, of course, in the last couple of scenes of Twelfth Night, all of the mysteries are revealed. Everybody figures out who everybody else is and how they got into the situation. Um, we even solved the subplots uh, related to Malvolio and, and the servants kind of confess to what they did to him. And finally, um, Elizabethan comedies are supposed to have a happy ending for everybody. And we almost have that here except for one character, who is Malvolio. So everyone else gets to kind of ride away into the sunset with their true love. But Malvolio never really gets any justice for the terrible things that have happened to him. So that's one way that, that Twelfth Night kind of departs from the traditional uh, facets of Elizabethan comedy. Um, finally, I wanted to give you some, some common themes of Twelfth Night, so some of the things that uh, maybe are kind of underlying or underneath the surface. So first we have this idea of reversal, which again relates to the festival of the Epiphany or the festival of Twelfth Night. Um, so first we have Viola and Cesario, so we have that reversal of gender. Um, so Viola goes from being a lady to being kind of a boy. Next, we have the reversal of servants versus masters, which we discussed. Um, we have that idea that the servants are actually more intelligent than their masters and actually kind of control the destiny of their masters in many cases. Um, finally, we have this idea of grief versus love. So everybody begins the play in a state of, of grief or longing. Um, and they end the play pretty much the opposite. So um, everybody who was suffering is now relieved. Everybody who was wanting to find the love of their life has and all those kinds of things. Um, next we have this kind of gender or battle of the sexes. So there's kind of an unspoken dialogue that goes on throughout the play about uh, men and women and, and who's the, the better, more faithful uh, lover. So I wanted to point out a couple of passages to you. First on page 88, um, Orsino says to Viola um, that, that women should have an older lover than themselves. Um, and so he says, let still the woman take an elder than herself. So wear she to him, so sway she level in her husband's heart. So basically he's saying here that a woman has to be more beautiful and younger than the man so that they can be equal. Because of course the man's going to be more powerful and intelligent. So that uh, might be a, a strike against Orsino. A couple of lines down, he says, Women are roses whose fair flower being once displayed doth fall that very hour. So he's again kind of being disparaging towards women and saying that, um, you know, the best thing about women is their beauty, but it doesn't last long. And as soon as it peaks, um, then they start to age and get less beautiful. Finally, I wanted to point out to you on page 94 another thing that Orsino says about women. He says, There is no woman, sides, can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. So he's saying there's no woman who could love anybody as strongly as I do. Women aren't capable of this kind of powerful love like I am. He says, No woman's heart so big to hold so much. They lack retention. Alas, their love may be called appetite. No motion of the liver, but the palate. So he's saying here, you know, women aren't physically capable of loving someone as much as I do. They can't be as serious. Um, now, of course, this is all kind of ironic because he's saying all of this to Viola, who does love Orsino very much um, and, and has, you know, kind of been faithful to him, whereas he actually uh, waffles about who he loves in the play. So he thinks he loves Olivia, but changes his mind. So really, he's not as, as faithful of a lover as uh, as he is, uh, as, as Viola is, rather. Later in that same speech, he says, Mine is all as hungry as the sea and can digest as much. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. So don't even think about comparing what a woman is capable of feeling versus what I'm capable of feeling. So he's kind of overstating himself here. Um, but again, we have some suggestions that Shakespeare is uh, kind of comparing men and women, and, and you can decide for yourself whether you think that he agrees with Orsino about women or whether he's kind of being ironic and sarcastic. Finally, we have this theme of pretense or disguise. So we have an idea of like fake versus real emotion, for one thing. So uh, throughout the play, 
uh, we have two characters who are certain that they feel the peak of emotion. So Olivia swears that she is grieving so much that she can't even date. And she says that she will grieve for years and years and not come outside. But of course, the minute that she meets Cesario, she changes her mind. And then the same thing with Orsino. Um, and he says um, that he is you know, the truest lover that there could possibly be. Uh, and that and that no one could ever, no woman at least, could ever equal him. So there, and, and of course, like we said, he changes his mind pretty easily once he figures out that Viola is a woman. He even seems to sort of be in love with her before he figures out that she's a woman. So he's not quite as, as constant as he seems. Of course, we have Viola, who is in a disguise. And then finally, we have the uh, subplot with Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Maria, where they pretend to write a love letter to Malvolio from Olivia uh, and make, get him to make a fool of himself. So we have another example of that, uh, people pretending to be something they're not or acting under a disguise. Um, so these are just a few themes of Twelfth Night. Certainly there are other themes that we could pick out, but I think these are enough to really get you thinking. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me.